Haircuts are not available right now. Brushes are. But I'd rather have haircut. This little machine's got a lot of extra stuff on it that I really want to take off. Stuff that they use, I'm sure, for production type work. Just added on bits and bobs. Maybe we'll even, you know, check this little jig out, see how it works. Because I think that would be neat. I think it is neat. And, uh, we'll have a look at the threading dial on this thing. We'll look at this machine a little bit. Because I'm waiting on parts for other projects and... This is something that I can do now. We'll look at all the equipment that Al brought me. So I'm going to lighten this little mill up, but before I start taking parts and stuff off of it, I want to share with you the fixture that some pretty talented tool and die maker probably made who knows how long ago uh, in probably a tool room in the factory that this machine set in. This thing is made to hold a couple different diameter uh, rods that get ran into the threading die that's in here. It's really nice how that they made this ad adaptable to hold different things. We got a toggle vise here that just clamps and holds the piece, the work piece. We have an air cylinder, a bimba air cylinder. Air comes in here. We have a 110 volt, what I'm assuming, uh, solenoid that is probably actuated by this button. So you probably push this button, air rushes into this air cylinder, single acting. It pushes the part that's held in here into the threading die and then retracts. So it's pretty neat. I like the way that they uh, got the dovetails and stuff in here. This thing I'm sure had to you know, be reliable and probably made hundreds and hundreds of thousands of cycles. And by the looks of it, it was probably trouble free. This thing's heavy built. So let's get a better look at it. I actually want to plug this thing up because I think I, I can and uh, get it to move back and forth. Show you how this thing was made because it's cool. So the depth that this thing goes in is limited by these threaded rods, these nuts. It's been pretty crude, actually, but I'm sure it works to keep this thing from hitting the spindle. Uh, it shouldn't, hopefully. Let's see if it does anything. Okay, solenoid works. I've got about 30 PSI on the air. Wow, that's pretty violent, actually. But it wouldn't be if it had a part in it. It would kind of probably push, you know, as it accepted it or threaded. Huh, that's pretty neat. Oh, it's strong. So I was looking at how this thing is attached to the table. It's actually keyed as well to the T-slot, and then I'm assuming the top of this vise has to come off, or the top of this unit fixture has to come off, because there's probably bolts that run down through the actual base of this to hold it on, because there's nothing external. Pretty pretty neat, and looks like adjustable uh, gibs on this thing as well. Let me get you a shot of the back here before I start taking this thing apart. See how they did their dovetails there? They're just socket-headed, recessed socket-head cap screws that hold their uh, their dovetails in and then this air cylinder is only held in by adjustable wedges that push out against those dovetails so this is adjustable as well pretty neat uh, this is made of 4140 this is 1018 the base is 1018 and this can be has multiple spots where it can be flipped to accept different diameter rods um, so that's pretty cool that's pretty well thought out actually Cool. Huh. Four socket head cap screws. That's it. Very well thought out. 
So look at the way that they come up with to hold this air cylinder into this dovetail. We just had two of these, one's actually stuck up under the machine. A little socket head cap screw in the back to center it in this nut. This is just a 9 16 nut. There was two of these, obviously, like I said. And it was, you just back these out to where it, friction actually just held this in. So you could adjust this right, left, or in and out. Um, it really wasn't hard fixed to anything. So that's pretty neat how they you know, accomplished that. This could probably easily become an air-powered vise if you had a jaw here, did a little extra work. That'd be pretty neat. It's definitely heavy enough for light duty work. Oh. So the table actually looks relatively decent on this thing. Not, not be all to pieces anyway. A few spots and dings on it that I see, like you would expect. So I can tell that fixture has been on this thing for quite some time. It's got more dings obviously on the outside of where the fixture was than where where it was setting. So it probably ran for a very long time. This was <clears throat> the side where people set their tools. You know, fixture was right here and they probably set any wrenches that they had right here. It was what it looks like anyway. Got some dings and some wear on the edge of the table here. Overall, looks pretty good. Peanut stopped in to check on my work progress, I guess. So this was neat. I was wondering how in the world the part would come out of here without, um, you know, reversing the spindle and just threading it out. But that moves in and out and engages or disengages these rolls that actually form a thread on the part instead of cutting a thread. They just, by force, uh, displace metal. So vice is back it pulls back on this it shuts the die you push the button it pushes it in and it rolls the thread on until it gets to a certain depth it disengages you let off the button the part comes out and clears the end of the die and then it resets with the thread rods that's really cool uh, definitely a production setup and the guys who thought this up were pretty uh, pretty crafty So that's a Landis uh, threading die. Pins, roll pins. Instead of cutting a dovetail on this, so this could be put on and off without having to slide it off the top. Definitely. Uh, these bolts uh, on the ends run through and put pressure on the pins. That's pretty slick. I like the way that uh, these guys thought. No, it's so little. Taper looks real good, huh? Spindle. Hmm. So this machine has grease fittings all over it. What appear to be grease fittings anyway. And I, but I highly doubt that they wanted grease 
on the ways of this machine. It's probably more for like a light oil, but of course every fitting that looks like a grease fitting probably got heavy grease pumped into it. I mean, at least that's what I'm seeing. And a lot of backlash in, uh, in the uh, saddle movement, but I'm assuming it looks like it's right here in this uh, coupling here. I think that it's not necessarily in the screw. We'll, we'll find out. But, and the table only moves, or the saddle only moves about an eighth of an inch and then locks up hard. All the mechanical stops are off, but I believe what is going on is it has a, I'll get you a shot, it has a power shaft, drive shaft that goes from the back into the gearbox here. And I believe where this thing set in this position so long that that telescoping shaft is just stuck. At least that's what I'm thinking. So let me show you what I'm seeing and uh, we'll look into it a little deeper. This here is a power drive shaft that runs from the back of the machine into the gearbox here. And when I move this back and forth, I'm not seeing it wanting to collapse at all. Looks like it's just pushing back into the machine and I don't want to try to force it. So I'm going to pull off this side cover and uh, get a little better look at it. Looks like it's full of chips down in there as well. This thing appears as if it was off-white, uh, the original color, like an eggshell or something like that from a few little spots that I've seen. Whoever painted this thing painted over just all kinds of chips and dirt. And uh, you know, speaking for myself, I would, I would much rather have a factory paint job that's all beat up than a crappy paint job that's painted over dirt and grit and chips. Wow, completely full of chips. A little universal joint. We got a little wear in that universal there. Probably last a hundred years. It was taken care of. Turns freely though. Turns actually really well. Let's see. Hopefully that helps. Yep, and it did. That's all it was. Stuck from being set in one position forever. Maybe this thing was a light blue. I'm not for sure. I'd be willing to bet at the time that this thing was made, you could have probably bought a small piece of property for the, for the cost of it. That's good. At least that works now. So the one good thing about a machine that was ran with cutting oil, at least for a portion of its life, is that even if it didn't get oiled or lubed directly by somebody, indirectly, you know, it got some form of lubricant on it from the you know, from the cutting oil. definitely gonna have to come apart to be cleaned just can't get all that out without taking them apart but I'm not seeing anything you know, that really concerns me just obviously anyway nothing that's obvious so we got a little staining on the ways here but you know, I'm looking at the part out here that doesn't get used versus the part right in here that is always in contact almost with the saddle. And uh, I'm not, I can't detect anything by, by feel anyway. No major scoring or anything. That staining won't hurt or anything. And so it's kind of promising, I guess. You know, obviously it has some dings and stuff that'll have to be stoned off. It may be a decent little meal. So that went from not moving at all to actually moving very nicely. And once you get a good handle and you know all the guts cleaned up on this thing, maybe just fine. At least that movement anyway. 
still a lot of parts left on this thing to look into. I need to get the proper handle for this thing. Looks like it's just a half inch drive, I think, but close. But the handle or the table moves great. And it doesn't appear to have a lot of backlash in it uh, either. Even though you're having to turn it through a gear train, it's not hard to turn. So anytime I see this kind of stuff, it's a bit concerning. But, you know, who knows? Does this thing have any oil in the gearbox for the spindle and stuff? This was completely painted over. It's just a clear sight through. So is the what looks like to me the drain plug and the fuel plug. So I'm going to pull out the fuel plug. Take a look inside. in there so let's pull out the drain plug and see if anything comes out it appears like there is but I mean it could just be that just could be so dirty that it's stained to look like it has oil in it I hope it does a little in there. Eh, maybe it does. Okay, well. <laughs> I'm sure it's been a while since it's been changed. Long before it was painted last. We'll flush all that out. Put some fresh oil on it. Those are all fiberglass. Should have known they wouldn't have been plastic uh, with something this age. So that's okay. There's where the extra belt that was hanging on the back of this came from. So whoever had this directly powered from the spindle powers the shaft that goes in for the auto feed. 
it turns good, but I've questioned why that was off. Maybe there's a problem um, with the gearbox, possibly, who knows, uh, because of all the silicone goo that they put on there. Maybe they've had issue. Uh, you know, I don't know. Probably not a big deal, but we'll just leave that off for now. No reason to do anything behind there. So looking into this electrical cabinet a little closer, other than the cord of oil that was in here, I did notice that this center motor starter is disconnected for some reason. Now this one here has much heavier wires coming out of it, so I'm assuming that this goes to the main spindle motor, and this either goes to the coolant pump or to the auto traverse motor that's on the table. It has three electric motors on this uh, on this machine. Now I'm assuming that this goes to that auto traverse motor and that it's disconnected for a couple, maybe one of two different reasons, maybe several actually. They either disconnected it because they didn't want the operator to accidentally hit it and lose the position of the production jig that's on here, or it has mechanical issues and they didn't want to, you know, it to be engaged, maybe causing further issues. Now this thing does have all that silicone goo wiped around the gearbox, which is not very confidence in stealing, but I'm gonna hope that it's just because you know, they didn't want the operator messing with it. At least the service guy did label the connections red, white, and blue, so I can connect these back up easily and not have to guess. Uh, I would look at the, the schematic, but it's a little soaked. I do have, I got a book with this machine, so I have a wiring diagram already, and plus a viewer sent me a, a manual as well. So we'll have to address this in the future, but at least, like I say, they did label that. But a bit concerning. We'll have to find out what the deal is. So compared to the K&T Mills oil, uh, cutting oil sump, this thing is a dream to clean out. You know, I haven't even pulled this out of here yet, but this looks like a homemade or a shop made oil catch. It's got a screen here, so the cutting oil runs down, comes out of a hole here, drains into here, has a little dam in there, probably you can't see it, uh, that probably contains most of the chips, runs over the dam and then gets picked up by the coolant pump and goes out this hose to the to the nozzle. So it's simple. Actually a uh, setup. Let's see if we can get this out of here. I'm just trying to get some of this loose stuff out of here so this machine doesn't continue to shed on the floor uh, every time I move something until I can really you know, dig into this thing. But I want to address a question that I get at least once every couple of weeks. I'll get an email with some photos attached and the person sending the e email will be asking me you know, my opinion on a machine that they're interested in buying. Do I think it's in good condition? Do I think that it's worth the money? In most cases, I can't tell you whether you know the machine is worth the money or not because really that's dependent upon your area and the availability of the machines. And you know, to one person, a machine's worth more than it is to others, so it's hard to hard to say. But what I can tell you is that don't focus all your attention, especially if you're at an auction where your time is limited. You know, most of the time the machines aren't plugged up. You've got to make a decision right then, you know, whether the machine's worth dropping your hard-earned money on or not. So don't focus all your attention on, on is it dirty? Because these machines were bought with production in mind and if they were used at all, they're gonna get dirty. That's just the nature of them. And anybody can slap a paint job on one that makes it look like a turd, but underneath that, it may be a good machine. So focus all your attention on the machine surfaces. Does the table move all the way from one end to the other without binding? Is it tight you know, with the table in its most used position, like in the center? You know, focus on stuff like that. Do the lead screws have more slop in one area than the other? You know, that'll tell you whether that's a better uh, indicator for a machine being in good condition than it dirty. Because those don't always go hand in hand. A dirty machine can be a good machine, but a clean machine can also be a wore out machine. And it's a lot easier to clean one up, you know, just appearance wise than it is to try to scrape one in. You, know, you don't have to be a machine rebuilder to clean one up. So. Don't focus your attention on the appearance necessarily. Focus all of your attention on 
the machine surfaces because in the end that's what's going to matter uh, you don't want to buy a boat anchor it's always a possibility but uh, you know it's more important that they be in good mechanical condition than in good uh, you know in good appearance that's just my opinion so if you've got limited time focus it on the machine surfaces not on you know is it dirty or not every year that goes by these machines get harder and harder to find you know they're obviously being phased out and have been being phased out probably for the last 50 years uh, the modern cnc machines can do what this thing does except for 10 times faster and you could still get parts for those things uh, so you know if you're if you're wanting a machine like this now is as good a time as uh, probably it's going to get in order to find one you hate to see them you hate to see them go, but you know, the fact is that a lot of them every year get sent to the scrapyard. And probably in the next 50 years, the only place you'll ever see these things will be in somebody's home shop or in some museum somewhere. So I've had this weed eater since I was, I don't know, before I was married. So probably 
18, 18 years minimum. It's a Shindawa T-231. Uh, I bought it, I think, for $15 at a yard sale. Guy said it didn't run. I took it home, put some gas in it, and it has ran ever since. Now, I have changed the fuel line, obviously, in all that time. Probably, I don't know, three to five times. Changed the spark plug a couple times in it. But that's it. Uh, you know, when a piece of equipment is good, this is definitely not a throwaway weed eater. Where I grew up as a young guy, there was nothing but horse farms for miles and miles. And you would see those guys out there weed eating, and they'd either be using steel weed eaters or they'd be using these Shindawas. And I always assumed if they were good enough to run miles and miles of fences, that they'd be great for a regular yard, and that's definitely been the case. It seems like these days, you know, you buy a weed eater at a box store, it runs for the season and then it doesn't start ever again and you buy a new one the next year. But that's not been the case with this thing, that's for sure. I like to run these aluminum disc heads. This is actually a Shindawa head. And I like to run the heaviest string, or one of the heavier strings. This is a 105 thousandths diameter square string. I just prefer these heads, even though you have to stop to restring. If you run that heavy string, you don't have to restring that often. Uh, but I prefer the lighter head because it's less fatiguing, you know, after an hour of weed eating. Um, you know, and otherwise you've got a spool, an uh, auto feeding spool of head or of string that you're having to pack around on the end of this weed eater. And uh, I find this stuff lasts for a very long time, even though I have a lot of rocks and stuff that I have to weed eat around in fences. So I figured I'd share that with you. It's been a great machine. And if you ever can pick one up, I don't can't speak for the new versions, but this thing has been amazing. So it definitely looks a lot better. It was completely packed full of fines, really fine metal debris from that threading die. There were some larger chips in there, but the majority of it was just a cake of hardened oil and uh, just super fine metal dust that that uh, die would have generated, that threading head. Uh, just got in there, you know, was settled and became a cake, actually. So, looks a lot better. I'm surprised this is not brass. Uh, somebody may have made that, and I'm, I just suspect that originally it probably was brass, but I, I don't know that. That's just an assumption. Anyway, much better than it was, uh, for now anyway. Let's in inspect this handle, see why we've got so much backlash in it, and see if we can maybe address that. I'm just interested to see, uh, you know, what's the deal with all that backlash. Is it wear, or is it just an adjustment issue? So we've almost got a half a turn, at least a good third or more uh, of backlash in this, but you can see it's got some play there. I'm sure there's a thrust bearing in here, um, and a nut here. Kind of strange looking. Let's see if we can take this apart and and get that out. I know it's going to have some. I mean, that's just the way it goes, but hopefully not that much. Definitely on there tight. Okay, so that nut sets the backlash. Uh, there's obviously a 
the thrust bearing, I think, back in here. At least, I believe I've seen one on this lower handle. It's probably made, made the same. So, this is what sets your uh, tension on your thrust bearing behind here. So maybe that's all it was. So that was just loose. But I want to look behind here anyway. Packed completely full of grease. And the bad thing about grease is that it holds all sorts of all sorts of metal particles in there as well. That's completely full of chips and stuff. check that clump of grease out. All of that just to lube what appears to be just a extremely small thrust bearing. So there's that little thrust bearing that all that grease was for. Now let's pull that out and clean it all up. So you ever drop a screw and it just completely vanish? Not even make a sound. Didn't even didn't even hear it hit the floor. I was putting one of these three screws back in, and yeah, I take this those out to clean out around there really good. Because I'm putting this thing back together, I'm not going to tear into it too deep. I've got too many things going on right now. Although I'm definitely happy with what I'm seeing so far on this machine. <laughs> That's a five sixteenths eighteen uh, screw, about inch probably an inch long at least. I dropped it totally just like it totally vanished. And uh, I guess somehow it hit my boot and shot up in between the machine and the pallet. I looked for it for probably 10 minutes and couldn't find it. Finally I did. Those satin chrome dials are going to clean up really good. Uh, we'll work on this some. Um, you know, I, I really want to focus uh, a lot of my extra time that I don't have working or that I have uh, when I'm working on this building, uh, more on the do-all bandsaw than on this for now. Although we'll work on everything that we have uh, and you know keep it mixed up, uh, but I'm committed to that to finishing that big saw. It's going to be nice when uh, when we get all that worked out and that thing cleaned up. As far as this machine goes, I'm really happy with what I'm seeing. Uh, nothing that I've seen uh, is a deal breaker as far as man, this thing's clapped out or you know just completely wore out. Um, I think with a little care, uh, we can really make a, a nice machine out of this. Most likely, you know, we could still run into catastrophic issues, but uh, you know, I haven't seen them so far, and that's good. So I'm in the back side of the shop here, uh, the upper portion where I'm going to be putting my drains in. Last week I dug all this out so I could get access uh, back here with some equipment. And I'm looking at this where I dug out. You know, this had access years ago, I'm sure, and over the years 
dirt and stuff has come off this hillside and filled this in and I think that if I don't do something back here in this corner or at least probably the back third or half of the shop here the dirt's going to continue to just wash down this hillside and fill this right back in it's just going to be a constant battle uh, for me to maintain access around through here so what I'm thinking is possibly a small retaining wall you know dig this back a few more feet concrete retaining wall at least the back half and uh, I'm hoping that possibly that will hold this back you know I can gravel this well and with my drains in here hopefully this will stay dry and give me good access because right now this is just a swamp and uh, you know you can't get hardly anything back here so it has to be dried up it has to be shored up uh, or else you know this is every time it freezes and thaws and rains this stuff's just going to continue to push in like it has for you know the last 30 years and eventually block off access all that dirt and stuff will clog up all the drain any drain that i put in here so unless i do something you know to keep this pushed back or held back you know it's just going to continue to cause me problems so i'm thinking you know small retaining wall here uh, hopefully in the near future it needs something anyway at least on this back half up here like i said it angle gets much less and it's not a problem but i don't know we'll see but something's got to be done back here i think so what i did here helped a lot i mean helped some still got a ton of backlash there which is in the nut and it looks like it's adjustable but i'm not going to try to tighten it up until all that stuff's taken apart and cleaned up Tightening up dirty machine surfaces or tightening up the gibbs on a dirty machine is not a good idea. Um, because it has slop in it, you're going to have dirt and grit in there, and then you tighten whatever it is up on that dirt, and you just embed it in the screws and in the ways and cause yourself a lot of, a lot of problems. So this thing's got to have a hardcore cleaning before anything, you know, is adjusted on it, obviously. So... This machine looks really promising, though. I'm not seeing any major scoring on it. Well, any scoring that I can even catch my fingernail on on anything. So, you know, maybe it's a good machine. Yeah, we'll see. Obviously, there still could be a ton of stuff wrong with this thing. But just my general inspection that I've done on this uh, is is promising. So I'm, op I'm optimistic about this machine. A lot of people were interested in this machine. Obviously, it is a good size for your average home shop. It's not got a footprint like the big K&T mill. They're not as hard, near as hard to move. And 30 taper is plenty big enough to do the majority of stuff that most of us want to do. So it's a, it's a popular size machine, actually. So I look forward to getting it cleaned back up and getting it back in service. But before I really do this, I want to focus the majority of my attention on the do-all bandsaw because I've already got it tore down and I don't want two machines tore down in a shop that's tore down. Because I need walls because they are better than tarps. My buddy Al should be showing up you know, here soon. We're going to dig the ditches for my drain as long as it's dry enough to do. Maybe peel back that hillside a bit for a possible retaining wall and then dig my foundation. It's still got to be done. Uh, not a lot has happened in here in the last week. I've been waiting on a few things. I've been working on the, uh, the erosion issue beside the shop. I've been working on that some, which is just moving rocks, so it's not all that exciting to see. But I'll show you when, when I make further progress on it. But that's the majority of work that I've been doing is you know, working on it. So we'll see. Still a ton to go, but uh, you know, made good progress on this shop, uh, considering I've done it all myself, almost. Uh, but with all this going on, you know, it's almost the way it has to be, really. Everything's pretty much shut down, unfortunately. And it's just the way it is. So. We'll see. Hopefully, got drawings. I got drawings from my engineer on the foundation, so that's good. Um, I've got a plan, and maybe in the next couple weeks, if it's available, you know, maybe concrete will be showing up for the footer and then uh, the stem wall. So I'm excited. So thanks for watching, guys. I really appreciate it. Start, stop down in the uh, description of this video if you want a peanut the squirrel mug or sticker. Uh, a few people bought them last week, so it's nice to know they're floating around out there. Uh, and I'm not the only one that owns one. So that's it. Thanks to my viewers, patrons, and subscribers. Hope you guys enjoyed this uh, little uh, 
dig into this machine. If you need anything, send me an email. Click on my little guy to subscribe to the channel. Thanks to anybody who supported me on this project. So that's it. Thanks for watching, guys, and I'll see you next time.